Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So in today's video we're close reading one of the most iconic speeches in the play Othello. Othello's It is the Cause soliloquy in Act 5, Scene 2. Now the tragic hero delivers the speech as he prepares to murder his wife Desdemona whom he believes to have cheated on him with his lieutenant Cassio. Now, if you've studied the play or watched my other Othello videos, which you can check out here, you know that Desdemona is in fact innocent and faithful till the end. Her misguided husband, however, has unfortunately bought into Iago's slanderous lies. What makes this particular speech so interesting though is that it reflects Othello in such a different emotional and mental state compared to the immediate preceding scenes, which portray him in a state of blazing fury and absolute determination to punish and ultimately kill his wife. Now, far from being livid and vengeful, Othello in this moment is reluctant, doubtful, pensive, and almost affectionate. It's as if he's already begun to regret his decision to murder his wife, but a greater force outside of his will is compelling him to push forward with the fateful act. So in the rest of this analysis, I'll illustrate my argument by close reading the effect of four specific literary devices in this speech. I'm taking a technique-driven instead of an ideas-driven approach, just because I get lots of feedback from students about not really knowing how to analyse the effect of literary devices in particular. But usually I would encourage close reading from the angle of ideas as opposed to techniques. But anyway, let's try this approach out today for the purpose that I have just stated. So if you're studying this play, you will need to know the speech inside out. So make sure that you watch till the very end to get all of the good stuff that's going to get you a top grade analysis. So let's start with the easiest device, repetition. One tip I like to give students who find it hard to start analysing passages is to always look for examples of repetition which is a great entry point because it's so easy to identify. In this speech, we see three examples of triple repetition, specifically with the phrases, it is the cause, it is the cause, it is the cause, put out the light, put out the light, and then put out the light, and one more, one more, one more. Now, if you've watched my video on three hard but useful literary devices in which I explained the possible effects of episusis, which is the device of successive repetition, you'll recall that I think sometimes when characters repeat a single word or phrase, it's usually a compensatory verbal reflex for their inability to come up with more concrete, accurate expressions. Here, Othello begins his speech by thrice repeating, it is the cause. But far from communicating resolute determination, the ambiguity of the statement, what cause, and the circularity of its repetitiveness seem to indicate Othello's mental paralysis, lack of clarity, and general hesitation towards his impending deadly act. After he kisses his sleeping wife and trots out one more, one more, and one more, which are all cues for him to kiss her three more times, he repeats the statement and action as a way to delay the actual killing. So by repeating the phrase one more, perhaps he's also trying to hypnotize himself into carrying out the act in a half subconscious state. And yet all the while, the static nature of the repeated phrases imply his wish for time to stand still and remain in a status quo so that he wouldn't actually have to move forward with the act of killing. So I've deliberately left my analysis of the put out the light, put out the light repetition to this section because I think it'll probably yield a more rewarding interpretation being discussed as an example of analogy. In Othello's speech, we see the use of simile and analogy in the following descriptions. That whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. And this is an example of simile comparing her skin to snow and alabaster. Put out the light and plucked the rose are examples of analogy. What do the references snow, alabaster, light, and rose share in common? They are all inanimate things. 
So is Othello objectifying his wife in this moment? It sure seems like it. But the more important question though is why? What does this objectifying impulse tell us about Othello's state of mind in this moment. On first read, Othello's comparison of his wife to snow and alabaster may suggest that he's idealizing her as this untainted, virginal figure whom he has put on an unrealistic moral pedestal. But if we consider the nature of snow and alabaster as these cold, hard substances, there's a possible hint of the notion that, from Othello, the husband's perspective, Desdemona, the wife, has come across cold and hard in her inability to empathize with her husband's anxiety about her closeness with and championing of another man. As we will recall from her insistent demands for Othello to retract his demotion of Cassio in Act 3, Scene 3, when she says, why, this is not a boon, I'm not asking you to do me a favor, etc. Still, Othello's affection for Desdemona is real. She is, after all, the light and rose of his life. And prior to his suspicion of her alleged adultery, he has viewed her as his singular source of joy and beauty, which also can be symbolized by light and rose. So wouldn't it seem a bit counterintuitive then to associate Desdemona with these lovely things at this point when he wants her dead? Now, one possible way to make sense of this is that Othello's forcing himself to repudiate Desdemona's humanity by associating her with objects so that the act of killing becomes just that much easier to carry out. Because by already conceiving his living and breathing wife in these dead inanimate forms, Othello could at least mitigate his murderous guilt. After all, you can't really kill what's already dead, right? By the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. If that line of reasoning sounds a bit twisted to you, then that's probably because Shakespeare wants to highlight the illogical state that Othello's mind is in by this point. We already know that the premise of his soon-to-be murder makes no sense, because Desdemona hasn't in fact cheated on him, and so far all the proof that he's fallen back on has been flimsy if not blatantly invalid. We see the twistedness of his thinking reflected in the use of hyperbaton, which is another one of the rhetorical devices that I explain in my three hard lit devices video. So if you've watched that, you'll know that hyperbaton is the inversion of normal word order. And in this speech, it appears specifically in the section with the light analogy, when he says, if I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me, but once put out thy light, thou cunning pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume. See if you can try identifying the hyperbatonic phrases in the excerpt just now. Can you find them? They are, I can again thy former light restore, as opposed to, I can again restore thy former light, and I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume, as opposed to, in a normal word order, I know not where that Promethean heat is that can relume thy light. Now, what is the fellow saying here? If he were to quench in the sense of blow out the flame, then there is always the possibility of him relighting the candle. But if he were to put out thy light, he says, then that's it. Not even the first fire of man, that Promethean heat, can revive the flame. But wait, what's the difference between quenching, blowing out, and putting out the light? Don't they both snuff out the flame? And since in Shakespeare's time, the word quench also meant put out, how does this supposed distinction make any sense? One way to understand this then is that when Othello says, put out thy light, he's no longer referring to the literal light of his flaming minister, but to the metaphorical light of Desdemona's life. And if he were to quench or put out Desdemona's light, 
which we can here also interpret as a pun on life, i.e. kill her, then of course there's no chance of bringing her back to life ever again. This confused line of reasoning then is partly borne out by the syntactical mix-up and switching that we just saw, as Othello allows his thoughts to become increasingly entangled, twisted and illogical for a similarly twisted, illogical course of action to happen. Now the final literary device that reveals Othello's mental struggle is paradox. A paradoxical statement is one that contains seemingly contradictory ideas, but can be made sense of when placed in a bigger context. The paradoxes in the speech pile up towards the end of Othello's soliloquy, after he kisses Desdemona and as he approaches the act of murder. Just as another fun exercise, try pausing the video in the next slide and find these examples of paradox yourself. How many did you spot? You'll probably have noticed a series of contradictions in the excerpt here. How could you kill someone first before you show them any love? And if a kiss is sweet, how could it also be deadly? And if one sheds a tear, then how could this compassionate response also be cruel? And if something is sorrowful, then how could it also be heavenly in the sense of delightful? Note as well that these paradoxes come in a sudden sequence, which creates a saturated sense of contradictory tension as Othello's mind veers increasingly between extreme opposite poles as he struggles precisely to hold them in coexistence. Of course, one of Othello's tragic flaws is having this binary dichotomous mindset, which struggles to reconcile opposite thoughts. For example, we see that in the way he thinks of Desdemona as being either Madonna or whore, or that she deserves to be haloized or else completely extinguished. So it would be in line with this characterization then that we should see him struggling so much in this moment, and his struggle is subliminally expressed by the string of difficult paradoxes here as he struggles to hold them in his mind. And that's it for this video, guys. I hope my close reading of this very important Othello speech has given you some fresh insights into Othello's character and psychology and demonstrated how you can go about analyzing the effect of specific literary devices. Most importantly, that you are also inspired to come up with your own ideas about the speech. There's really so much more to unpack about this rich moment, and I really just touched the nano tip of the iceberg. For instance, you could consider examining the rhythmic patterns or the formal intricacies of the speech by analyzing the use of enjambment and lineation, etc. So you can try challenging yourself by looking at those aspects. In any case, please hit the thumbs up button if you found this video helpful so that YouTube knows to share this video with other passionate top grade lit students like yourself. Please subscribe if you haven't already and switch on that bell notification so that you don't miss out on any of my future weekly study videos. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.